We are more than ones and zeros, pushing frontiers of science to answer how we came to be, taking journeys to Mars where the tiniest pieces of life may exist, unraveling mysteries of black holes, gravitational waves, the nature of time. We are more than algorithms, peering into the depths of ourselves, decoding our molecules, our cells, our DNA, bringing hope to those who suffer from disease. We are more than petaflops, measuring the ocean's might, envisioning its dance with the atmosphere above and the seafloor below, capturing the global impact of a single wave. Collaborators, colleagues, and friends, we are connected by a common thread, the determination to make positive change. We are more than HPC. Please welcome your SC20 General Chair, Christine Quickie, Director, Navy Department of Defense Supercomputing Resource Center. Welcome to SC20. I'm Christine Quickie, the General Chair. On behalf of the IEEE Computer Society, the Association for Computing Machinery, and the SC20 Planning Committee, we're thrilled that you'll be joining us on our virtual journey into what makes us more than HPC. While we're presenting this conference in a different format this year, we've worked really hard to ensure that it resembles previous SC conferences as much as possible. This new environment has also enabled us to bring SC20 to places and people that we've never before reached. To these newcomers, I extend a special welcome. As a community, we use HPC to tackle the enormous problems that wouldn't be solvable any other way. HPC can help us reach an understanding of the world around us more quickly so that we can work today to create the solutions for tomorrow. As we find our field expanding deeper into areas of AI, machine learning, and quantum computing, HPC has become a key tool for a growing range of scientific disciplines. This is evident in the critical role our community is playing in the fight against the global pandemic of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. A global pandemic requires a global response. The COVID-19 HPC Consortium is an international working group comprising 43 member countries, including the US, Korea, Japan, Switzerland, and many others. Members of the consortium are contributing scientific expertise and over 600 petaflops of computing power to support over 80 pandemic-related projects, many of which are now underway. For example, on the Frontera system at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, researchers are testing the efficacy of existing antibodies from a previous version of the SARS virus to see if they will work against COVID-19. At one of Italy's leading scientific hospitals, researchers are reconstructing and modeling how the coronavirus binds to cells at a molecular level. On Summit at Oak Ridge National Lab, a team is using a machine learning classifier to predict coronavirus gene expression patterns for more than 700,000 combinations of existing drugs. And researchers at universities in the United States and Brazil are using HPC to perform social interaction analytics to improve contact tracing methods and better inform policy decisions. Promising to deliver compelling insight into the role of HPC in the ongoing pandemic, our More Than HPC plenary panel will dig deeper into the use of AI, the Internet of Things, and data analysis to understand and combat the coronavirus. Exhibits are still a central part of our conference. Nearly 300 exhibitors from over two dozen countries are featured in our virtual exhibits hall, and you can find them on the exhibits tab on our website and app. They've worked hard to create experiences that will engage and educate us in this new format. Please join me in thanking our champion level exhibitors who have helped make SC20 a success. SC20 has brought the state of the practice to the forefront for those who work steadfastly behind the scenes to design, build, and run HPC centers and the infrastructure that supports them. These professionals have a wealth of knowledge to share but few opportunities to reach fellow practitioners directly. To bridge the gap, the conference features dedicated talks to discuss practical up-to-the-minute improvements in areas such as HPC training, security, software provisioning, and data management. This year's technical program offers the full complement of content that is the backbone of this conference, including papers, panels, posters, birds of a feather, tutorials, and workshops. 
In addition, a wonderfully strong program of invited speakers will address topics ranging from analytics that inform strategic decisions to assure the survival of threatened species to the responsible application of HPC. For 30 years, the heartbeat of the SC Conference has been the Synet team and their marvelous feat of engineering, building what becomes the world's fastest network for the duration of the conference. While events have precluded this year's network build, Synet is creating virtual test beds to highlight emerging network technologies and has featured this work in several presentations in their program. As part of our continued attention to inclusivity and diversity, SC20 has developed the HPC in the City program. The Student Hackathon is bringing together a diverse group of Atlanta area students, educators, and civic leaders to demonstrate firsthand how HPC can address local challenges such as social justice issues. Students at SC continues to be a vibrant and crucial part of the SC conference. Our new HPC immersion program gives undergraduate students who are traditionally underrepresented in HPC and related fields the opportunity to experience the conference while guided by world-class mentors. We have transformed the student cluster competition into a fully virtual experience, giving an unprecedented number of teams the opportunity to participate this year. Thanks to sponsorships from our vendor partners, student teams are designing and building virtual clusters in the Microsoft Azure Cloud. We've also expanded the job fair this year so that it's not just for students, it's for everyone. Those of you who have contributed to the SC20 technical program, exhibits, Synet, and students at SC programs have had to put in extra effort this year to help us have a comprehensive conference, and we thank you. We invite you to join us at the awards ceremony at the conclusion of our conference, when we'll highlight some of the top accomplishments of our community. Planning the world's largest supercomputing conference isn't an easy task, even in a normal environment. When I was first selected to be the SC20 general chair three years ago and began forming the conference committee, none of us had any idea we would be planning a conference amidst a global pandemic. And this largely volunteer team of over 700 people has worked harder than ever to ensure that SC20 not only stayed on the map, but did so with its customary breadth and depth. To quote Game of Thrones producer Christopher Newman, all you can do with any large operation is get the best people around you and let them go. These volunteers have given generously of their time and expertise, and without them and our partners, SC20 simply would not have been possible. It has been my deepest honor to work with this incredibly tenacious team. Please join me in thanking our colleagues for their tireless efforts. From COVID-19 to clean transportation, our community is tackling every problem we encounter with determination and speed. Whether we're helping to accelerate the development of new gene therapies or working to understand the very origins of our universe, we're making incredible strides. But that doesn't mean we can rest. We have so much more to do to improve the world around us, and that's why we're more than HPC. In a moment, you'll be hearing from this year's keynote speaker, Dr. Bjorn Stevens, whose study of clouds has contributed greatly to our understanding of climate change. This is of profound interest to me, both professionally and personally. I live on the hurricane-prone Gulf Coast of Mississippi, where I lead the Navy DOD Supercomputing Resource Center. So climate, weather, and ocean modeling have a direct impact on my daily life. Thanks to improvements in observational instruments and computing capabilities, Hurricane forecasting has improved significantly over the past two decades, helping all of us protect property and save lives. For that, I am grateful, and I'm very much looking forward to learning more as Dr. Stevens leads us on a fascinating journey of where we've been and where we need to go in climate research. Professor Bjorn Stevens is a director at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology since 2008 and a professor at the University of Hamburg. To say Professor Stevens is a man with his head in the clouds is an understatement. That's because he strongly believes that clouds are at the heart of some of the most fascinating questions posed by climate change. And it's why he's recognized as one of the world's leading experts on how atmospheric water, in the form of clouds, shapes our climate. As Professor Stevens explains, massive new sets of observational data analyzed with the power of exascale computing will break barriers for researchers building fundamentally new climate models, giving us resources to investigate the planet at the most granular level. 
Professor Stevens served as a lead author of Clouds and Aerosols for the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which informs policymakers as they consider programs to mitigate impacts of climate change. Professor Stevens holds a great number of prestigious honors, among them the Clarence Leroy Meisinger Award of the American Meteorological Society. He held fellowships at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Professor Stevens received a master's degree in electrical engineering from Iowa State University and his PhD in atmospheric science from Colorado State University. Here to take us through a remarkable journey to the clouds in the era of exascale, please welcome Professor Bjorn Stevens. Hi, my name's Bjorn Stevens, and it's a pleasure to have a chance to speak to you all today. I'm going to tell you a story about climate and computing. You know a lot more about computing than I do, and I know a thing or two about climate. And to help bring the two things together, it might be useful to know something about this book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The, the, the main idea in the book that's useful for today's story is that a civilization, an advanced civilization, has a big question they want answered. They build a really big computer to answer it. The computer thinks for a really long time. The computer's name is Deep Thought. It thinks deeply for 75 million years. And it comes up with the answer to the ultimate question that they posed. But by that time, the descendants of the people who built the computer forgot the question. So they went about and built another computer one out of organic components, and they called it Earth. And the idea then was to go into the computer and learn more about the question that they got the ultimate answer to. And so if you keep that in mind, then you're all set for today's story. So it starts off here in Hamburg, where I'm at. And this picture brings together a lot of the elements that we're going to use through the rest of the story. Um, it also has the colors from Supercomputing 2020 in it, which isn't such a bad thing either. But the, the, the main point that you see here is it's a, it's a wonderful port city, and you see the, the face of industry and global trade in the background. It's one of the largest container harbors in the world. And you see different ways of, of, of living in the foreground with the bikes. You see a thin layer of clouds up there. These are stratiform clouds, which end up being a joker in the story. But the elephant in the room is the boulder, this big rock. It's called a glacial erratic in technical terms. In German, you would call it a findling. And if you go through the North German countryside, you'll find little town after little town has these right in their town square because they're dug out of the fields. And for a long time, people had uh, no idea where they came from. You know, how do you get a giant boulder in the middle of a field? In this case, it was in the middle of the river when they were deepening the river. So, so how does that work? And there was a time where people thought this was from the biblical floods that brought the boulders from somewhere else. But about the middle part of the 19th century, people began to understand that these were carried by the waxing and waning of great ice sheets which covered the northern European continent. And the fact that these ice sheets waxed and waned across the continent meant that the climate probably wasn't always the same in the past. And that raised a question of how it might have changed. This rock here, it's called the Alte Schwede, the old Swede. It's called the Alte Schwede because it's been shown to come from a formation of rock in southern Sweden about 400,000 years ago in the Elstad glaciation. But the Alte Schwede is kind of a nice name for this because um, it points to another light motif of our story, this guy here. Svante Arrhenius. He was a chemist, and in the second half of the 19th century, he was interested in this climate question. And he began thinking, you know, how could this be? How could the Earth be a lot colder or a lot warmer? And he was informed at that time by the discovery that some gases were opaque in the infrared, even though they were transparent in the visible. And that these gases, which occur in Earth's atmosphere naturally, could provide an important mechanism for maintaining the surface temperature. 
So he worked out this idea that you see here that the surface temperature, T surface, or the average surface temperature of the Earth, could be related to how radiant energy, that's R, radiation flows through the system. And he thought about a bunch of other things too. So he introduced this idea of H, that the horizontal heat transport might matter. And he introduced V, the idea that the vertical heat transport might matter. O, other things could matter. And C was the carbon dioxide and water vapor. These were the greenhouse gases. So his, his thought was, you know, if you want to understand Earth's surface temperature, you've got to understand this stuff. Problem was, he didn't, he didn't really understand any of them. He, he, he knew that C could increase. He didn't know why, but he said, let's just let carbon dioxide increase. He said, let's not worry about the other stuff. And forget about V for a sec. That's too hard. And let's forget about H. And let's just try to work out the radiation. So he said, okay, we can imagine C changing, like um, increasing, like I just showed, to two or other numbers, two times as much. And how will the radiation respond? Well, to figure that out, he had to piece together the puzzle into, into giving a form to that equation. And he did that by making a little model which had two layers, a surface and an atmosphere. And in the atmosphere, you assign some infrared opacity, which then the C could influence. And by working through the energy balance of those two layers, he could pop out an estimate of how the surface temperature would depend on C. So he had a kind of method to do it, but he actually didn't even know how to do the radiation. He knew roughly, he had it all kind of going in streams, but he didn't know the infrared opacity here um, designated by beta. So the other clever thing he did was he figured out a way to get beta. And the way he got it was with some good old Appalachian moonshine. Not the type of moonshine you see there, but more the type of moonshine you see here. It's the reflected sunlight off the moon, which a guy named Langley had been using to calculate the infrared opacity of, of, of columns of water vapor and CO2. So by using the sunlight reflected from the moon, you could do the spectroscopy to get estimates of how opaque CO2 would be given its amount. The problem was these, these measurements were not in the exactly the right wavelength that one needed, but you, know, you can always extrapolate, and he did, and he took these measurements and he put them in his model and he came up with a, a rough answer. So if you think about that, this was the question. Would increasing CO2 warm the Earth? Fast forward here. This was 1890 when he was doing it. This is today, and I'm standing in a valley of the Mortarach Glacier. And that, you see, is in the background. If you look way in the background, you see that glacier. It's about three kilometers away. Um, at the time Arrhenius was thinking about his question, the glacier was right where I'm standing. It was actually moving down the valley towards the town in the 1800s. And at the time Arrhenius began thinking if CO2 would warm the climate, more people were worried about the climate getting cold and the, and the glaciers advancing even further into the valleys, into the town. So this question that he asked wasn't at all obvious. It was the ultimate question. It tended, it, it ended up being a very important question, but it wasn't one that you would naturally lead yourself to ask at that time. And the answer was, okay, pretty rough. Um, but it outlines the, 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 the question that we feed to deep thought over the next 50 or 70 years. To understand how this goes, there's something else about the glacier and its retreat which might be informative. And that's that the glacier doesn't move all in one go slowly backwards. So the glacier started, it turned around about the time Arrhenius was thinking about these questions, and it headed up the valley. But it didn't head up in a steady pace. It went in, you know, uh, spurts. And you can see that here in this graph. So what the graph shows is in the blue bars, it shows sort of the yearly retreat from the, I think, 1870 up until the present. And then the, the black line shows the accumulation of that. So the steady retreat, once in a while, I think there's a few years where it comes forward, but mostly all the way down. And what you see, it doesn't happen all in one steady go. There's, there's periods in the beginning where it goes quickly, then not much happens, and it goes quickly, and then not much happens. And that's also like the science. So the science, or the way deep thought you could think about it, is, is trying to understand the changes from CO2 is not unlike this glacier. There's, there's long periods where we ponder on things that seem sort of unrelated, and then they come together in bursts of creativity. And once in a while, even in lull periods, like we see in this third epoch where not much is happening, there's that spike right there where something brilliant happens, and then we go back to the lull. 
And so this glacial retreat actually is a bit like the story of deep thoughts contemplations or our contemplations about climate science in that you can think of four epics. The first one was the first word. The second one was, you know, this, this contemplation. Third one was sort of brilliant discoveries. Then we have constructive babble. So those were the four epics up till now. And now we're at the position where deep thought 75 million years later, or in our case, um, 120, is about to burst out the answer. So let's go to the first period. The first period is characterized by about 50 years where people forgot all about the ultimate question. So they didn't have to wait 75 million years to forget. They forgot right away. No one worried about Arrhenius's paper, Arrhenius, uh, Arrhenius's ruminations. They were busy doing other things, figuring out the weather. But it turned out important. So this guy here, Wilhelm Bjorknes, also in Stockholm at the time, 1906, was trying to figure out the equations you needed to solve to figure out how the weather would evolve. It turns out later in our story, these equations are exactly the ones you need to figure out the H in Arrhenius's question. Another guy had this idea that you could actually compute the equations. So um, Lewis Richardson, he had this crazy idea that you could predict the weather by solving those equations, but of course they're much too complicated to solve. Um, and by the time you solved them, the weather would be gone. But he said, no, 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 no. What we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll have many, many people solving it, different parts of the equation. So we'll lay out people in a giant amphitheater and each person will be at a particular point and they will solve for their weather at that point. And they can ask their neighbors, you know, that's a one-to-one. Um, -one. They, can, they can ask their neighbors what, what their information is to figure out temperature gradients and how the temperature will change. And everyone will compute. And if you look, you'll see there'll be a, 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 a scheduler um, which will be coordinating all the computations with its little spotlight beaming down on the, on the different, um, essentially, nodes of the computation. So even here, you see the architecture of a massively parallel computer where we see multi-core nodes where everyone has their computation multi-threaded and the scheduler is going around. The only thing you wish for is, is in this computer is to, I mean, node failures are a lot more dramatic here than they are in, in our modern machines. Crazy idea. But maybe it wasn't so crazy as we've seen, because the machines were be developed not that much later. So we go into the 40s. John von Neumann had this project to sort of blend emerging computing machines with this idea of computing the weather. He used a simplified version of, of, of Bjorknes's equations. But they showed with um, these machines that were emerging at the time, post-war, that you could actually compute the weather. And this was an important ingredient that was later taken by um, other people to, to fill in H. At the same time, it wasn't that people just were working on Arrhenius's H term unknowingly. People were also working on other terms, like this guy, Fritz Müller. He um, was at Ludwig Maximilian's Universität in Munich. And he was doing a new assault on R. So he was an expert on radiative transfer. And unlike the other people, he was interested in Arrhenius's question. But he realized you needed to do R a lot better. And here I show a picture of him. And the graph there is from one of his papers where you, you see he's trying to work out this absorption feature from CO2, which is the thing that Arrhenius was trying to use to calculate his beta. He wasn't measuring in the right place or using measurements at the right wavelength. Um, but but um, Müller was, was, was on the path to doing this in the right way. So this was all happening, and there was one more piece of the puzzle, and that's the guy there sitting with the glasses, looking at the two younger gentlemen. His name was Joe Smagorinsky, and he was the first director of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey. It was, a, it was the follow-on to this effort of von Neumann to calculate the weather. And what Smagorinsky, his stroke of brilliance was one in building a team, but in the other aspect, realizing that these methods people had been developing to calculate how the weather moves were exactly what you needed to calculate H. And he put together a lab and the machines that would allow you to build circulation models of the whole Earth that would allow you to calculate the H term. So that got us through this grand contemplation of the, of the glacier retreating, and it takes us to about 1965. Not much had happened. The glacier had been retreating. Here I stand in 1965, and to give you a sense of time, at, 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 at this point, summer of 1965, that's when I was conceived, born in the spring of 1966. The glacier was, was there where you see it, where I'm standing. 
And now it's, it's come into our sight. You know, we're closer. We're seeing where it is. Um, we're feeling nearer. But it's still a, a long ways away. So we haven't really understood anything. Deep thought hasn't really given a peep as to the answer to the ultimate question. But a lot of stuff has happened in the background, and the glacier, meanwhile, has ponderously retreated up the valley. And then something brilliant happens. Actually, a paper is published in 1967 from this kid, Suki Minabe. I mean, see him there with his, I, I don't know what kind of dermal that is. Maybe some of you have one at home still. But, but he understood. He took, working with actually Fritz Müller, he returned to this Arrhenius question. And he said, well, you know, Arrhenius, brilliant guy, great question, but he did it wrong. Um, so uh, Manabe showed that to really understand the question, you needed to formulate it differently. You couldn't throw V away. You needed V, this vertical transport of heat. He also realized you couldn't solve for V directly, but he found a clever indirect way of putting V in the equation in a way that was approximately right. He worked with Muller to figure out how to do the R right, and he took advantage of the computing machines that Smagorinsky had sort of surrounded him with to make the first compelling calculation of what the surface temperature would do if you increased C by a factor of two. So it was, it was, it was, it was wonderful because he literally turned Arrhenius' theory on its head. He introduced a model for V, and he, he took the latest understanding of R, and he brought this equation full force forward, and he gave the first sense of an answer. It was, it was as if deep thought kind of burped in the middle of its contemplation at year, say, 50, 50 million. So it was terrific. But if you look at that equation, H is still missing, O is still missing, V is approximate. Do we believe him? As an example, let's just think how he treated R. So if you look at R, you know, this is the radiation, it's the R term, and the radiation, uh, the radiation Arrhenius treated as sort of one stream with the wrong spectroscopy. Manabi said, let's treat it as four streams. So we have sort of um, water vapor and, and CO2 and ozone. And that's a bit illustrated here. It shows the absorption spectrum in the infrared. This is the wavelengths where Earth is trying to radiate its energy to space. And if the atmosphere was transparent, that orange line you see wouldn't be up and down and up and down and up and down. It would follow this wonderful Planck curve, which is illustrated by that little white curve on the bottom right. It wouldn't be that low, but it would follow the envelope of those ups and downs. And every time you see that orange line go down, it means that there's absorption taking place, mostly from water vapor, CO2, ozone. And in the middle, right in the middle, you see this big absorption feature where a bunch of lines go down, and that's the CO2 absorption band that I pointed to before from Müller's work in the 30s. And so if you look at that, you see it's fantastically complicated. And Manabi just kind of represent that sort of as four streams, or three or four streams, depending how you, you count the overlap. And when you unfold that, you see it's fantastic. I mean, it's not like there's four regions. There's just thousands and thousands of absorption features that you have to calculate your way through if you want to do the radiation right. Of course, they didn't even know that at the time. I mean, they knew the absorption features. That comes from... Um, quantum physics, but, but they didn't know where they were, they didn't know their multiplude, they, they didn't know the strength, and even if they did, there was no way in hell they could compute them. It turns out today we could compute them, and we have, so this graph was made by Lucas Kluft, a, a graduate student working with me, and he repeated Manabi's calculations, the same ones, but he just did R based on all that we know today. He calculated every single line in that thing, and the rest he left the same, you know, that approximation of V leaving out H, forgetting about O, and so on. And he came up with the same answer. So Manabi was good. I mean, he was really good. He, he got it right in a very simple way. And it really ended the first era of deep thoughts contemplations. So if we go back just to recap, you know, we began at the end of the 19th century, 1896 was Arrhenius' first paper on the topic, where he had the idea, he kind of knew the ingredients and he puzzled him his way to a, a sensible solution. But, I mean, there was lots of things that weren't really right. And a lot of science happened in between, not paying much attention to what he did. But then we saw some machines emerge, which allowed 
this guy, Manabi, to turn Arrhenius' ruminations on their head and show how to solve the problem right and give the very first estimate. It's sort of like, ah, deep thought's done. Not quite. It turns out, like you can imagine, right? This was, this V was approximate, H wasn't there, O wasn't there. So a lot of people say, hey, that's just a pre-answer. I mean, that's not right. You know, why do we believe Manabi? Manabi asked that himself. He said, why would I believe Manabi? Probably he believed himself. But the reason he wouldn't believe himself is he knew the Earth looked something like that. So this is a picture of Earth from space. It's a satellite image. It just shows part of the disk. And what it shows in the very dark colors is um, thermal radiation. That dark means there's lots of it coming. And that's because it's coming from deep in the atmosphere, near the surface where the temperatures are high. Where it's gray, that means there's a lot less radiation because the stuff that's emitting the radiation is much colder. So it's coming from higher in the atmosphere because we know as you move through the troposphere, the temperature decreases. And where it's white, it's, it's, it's radiation that's emitted from the very coldest parts of the troposphere, where temperatures are about 100 degrees Celsius colder um, than, than, than zero, and hardly any radiation is escaping to space. That's where we have clouds, which are, which are essentially emitting radiation at very cold temperatures in the upper troposphere. And what you see in this, in this figure is different patterns. You see swirls towards the poles, which will move generally from west to east. So if we let this move like it does, the satellite's watching in time, you can see how these swirls evolve. And these swirls are a visual manifestation of how the circulation is transporting heat and moisture from the equator, where it gets a lot of energy, to the pole, where it loses its energy. And it shows how this transport happens in different ways. At the, at the high latitudes, you see the swirls. In the middle, near the equator, you see more like this, I don't know, this sort of, you see these pulses. And it, it doesn't have this directionality from, from west to east and south to north, where you see the, 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 the transport going on. So it's a different mechanism of heat transport. And what you see is in the tropics, this heat transport is much more vertical. And that's because the climate system, as this figure shows, is really trying to do two things. It gets a lot of energy from the sun, and most of that goes into the oceans and the tropics. That energy is transported into the atmosphere by deep storms, like you see here now as you look into the atmosphere, deep storms forming over land and over the ocean and the tropics. That's the V. And it's transported to the poles by the H, this horizontal heat transport. So Manabi's calculation had none of that, really. It had a, a crude trick to calculate what the V is doing, and it had none of the H. So there's lots of ways other than R being wrong in which it could be wrong. And he realized that, so he, he said, we need to couple this to the bigger problem, him and his boss, Joe Smagorinsky. Um, all along, they had the idea is, let's put this into a circulation model of the type that was calculating the weather, and that would allow us to evaluate whether H makes a difference. And so they made models that look kind of like this. And here, the color skating is similar. There's some purples there, which is um, rain. But again, the black is where the atmosphere is very dry or um, very transparent, and, and lots of energy is coming out of the system and going to space. And white is areas where the, the part of the atmosphere which is radiating energy is, is very high in the atmosphere and very cold. And you see these systems moving in the extra tropics at the high latitudes, at the latitudes of North America or Europe moving from west to east. And the same thing in the southern hemisphere, you see them moving from west to east. And then they're kind of blinking spastically in the tropics. And that's because the circulation model can do the H OK on these scales, but it really doesn't have a clue about V other than to use that, let's call it the trick or the cleverness of Manabi to, to indirectly represent the V. So when you do this calculation, it, 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 you, you end up more or less getting the same answer as he did with the simpler one, where he neglected H. And so what, what this does is it brings us to um, another milestone around the year 1980, 1979 to be precise. And here I am in 1979 in the, in the life of our glacier. We're kind of narrowing in on it. It's still retreating on us. It left this big stone for us to remind us of the Alta Schweda. Um, but here we are in 1979 getting close to where we want to be, you know, asking the glacier the meaning of the universe or why it's going um, away. We're close to where we want to be, and it's, it's, it's a milestone year because we've, we've rediscovered Arrhenius' question, 
and we've worked out a pretty good semblance of an answer. We've got H, we've got R. Okay, V is a problem, and we don't know so much about O. And this was sort of a capstone of this was this wonderful report called the Charney Report, written in 1979, very short, easy to read, beautiful report, which summarized the knowledge at that time and the observation that CO2 was increasing to make the first sort of formal statement about what deep thought might eventually give us when it was ready to give us the answer. So 1979, great report, most elements of the answer, and at this point, you could say, well, you know, we're, we're mostly done, and there's reasons I'll get to in a few minutes, which would ex lead us to expect that we're not going to get much better than what was written down in this report. But, but one thing did happen. So we're now entering this, I think it was the third phase in that, in that, that chronology I, I, I gave you, this, this period of constructive babble that I referred to. We had tools that allowed us to calculate how the circulation H connected to the radiation. We couldn't really deal with V. We hadn't really thought too much about O, but we had a good sense of the question and we had a rough idea of the answer. You know, doubling CO2 would lead the Earth to be, according to this report, it would be one and a half to four and a half degrees warmer. So in this period of constructive babble, there was this one genius stroke. Um, as I remember that diagram where I showed the glacier receding year by year and in this third epoch, not much happened, but there was this one excursion. This guy is kind of like that excursion, this erratic excursion. He's, he's someone um, from Hamburg, actually. He, for a long time, he was the founding director of my institute. Um, he's retired now, goes often for walks, not so far away from the Alte Schwede. But what he did when he was back, um, a younger man, was he realized that it's not enough to know that the Earth should warm when there's CO2. We should be able to detect it. And what he did was he worked out two things. He worked out what's our expectation for how the system would behave if there was no warming? What's the natural variability in the system? And he understood very deeply that, that the Earth system has this, this wonderful way of digesting, let's call it weather noise, the noise of passing weather systems, digesting them by the ocean in a way that translates them into long-term variability, so decadal and multi-decadal and centennial which means that we could observe a warming Earth in a retreat of a glacier for reasons which might have absolutely nothing to do with increasing greenhouse gases. And he went from that realization to also realizing that if the warming that we're observing is from CO2, it might have a signature that looks different than the signature of natural variability. And he set out with a team to build models that you could put on computers like this one. I think that's the one they used eventually that you could put on computers like this Cray 2S to actually work out how the fingerprint of warming might differ from the signature of natural variability and ask the question, can we detect the warming from observations? And lo and behold, he could. And so this was the very first detection to say that not only was Manabi particularly clever, but the ideas he developed allowed us to say that the warming we observe isn't natural variability. It's not the effect of the sun. It's from increasing greenhouse gases. So that was a, a master stroke. But other, otherwise, in this period of, of a constructive, constructive babble, I would say, you know, mostly people just tried to make the models like I showed before, that black and white one, a bit more colorful with a bit more rev, uh, resolution. And, and that's sort of shown here. This is a, the type of model that leading climate centers around the world use today to make these climate projections. They're not really different from what Manabi was doing in any structurally important way. They've got lots and lots and lots more bells and whistles. So you could think of this positively as that people have been fiddling with this O term. They've been adding, you know, other things into the system to see if it really changes the picture. And what you realize is it doesn't change the picture. The big thing, and Manabi taught us that at the, at the very beginning, you know, when he corrected Arrhenius' calculation, the big thing is getting the V right. And as pretty as people make these sorts of models look, they don't help in the least with V. And now I want to explain to you why V is difficult and why, back when Manabi was doing this, we shouldn't expect to get V right. So this is a Earth at night. And if we let the film roll, what we see is that as we rotate, we come into the view of the sun and the sun rises. And what I wanted to illustrate here is how thin 
the atmosphere is. And this thinness of the atmosphere on one hand is a really wonderful thing because it means that the H term involves a sort of quasi two-dimensional circulation. There's not a lot of vertical going on. Transporting energy from the equator to the pole happens in a thin atmosphere and you don't need to worry so much about the vertical to get it right. And that's what allowed us, they have very large scales, that's what allowed us to make progress. But the thinness becomes a problem when you think about V. So you can attach some numbers to this, and I've done that here. And what you see is we know the Earth's circumference is about 40,000 kilometers. So going from the equator to the pole is, is, is about 10,000 kilometers. The eddies, these swirls that move the energy, are about 1,000 kilometers on a characteristic scale. So to represent them in a computer in the way that Manabi and Smagorinsky did, you need to be able to discretize the Earth in, in, in blocks that resolve circulations which are about 1,000 kilometers. They could do that in the, in the 70s. But if you want to get V, you need two orders of magnitude. You don't need 1,000 kilometers, you need 10 kilometers because the atmosphere is so thin. But if you think of that, 10 kilometers, that's a factor of 100 from 1,000. So you need machines which can resolve scales which are a factor of 100 smaller. Doesn't seem like a lot, a factor of 100, but the problem is the atmosphere, the problem has four dimensions. We have to integrate in time. We have the left, right, the back, forth, the up and down. So we've got three spatial dimensions and one time there's four. So 100 times larger is 2 to the 7, that's 128. But in four dimensions, that becomes 2 to the 28. So it's a massively larger calculation to get V. And in 1979, you had absolutely no right to expect to get it. Because computers were increasing, sure, we had Moore's Law, we had doubling every, 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 every year and a half or so. But really, what kind of technology has exponential growth for what seems like forever? Well, it turns out it's your kind of technology. So if you go back to 1965, when Manabi was doing, doing, doing his calculations, and you look, you know, it's fantastic. We've seen this, this doubling of, of computational capacity going on and on and on and on. Nothing, nothing does this. This shouldn't happen. Think of any other technology that goes, you know, exponential growth is no big deal. That happens all the time for a short period of time. But having exponential growth that goes on forever and ever and ever like this, 50 years, is just crazy. So you could ask yourself, well, in retrospect, we had half a century of doublings. Maybe we should go back and ask ourselves, maybe V isn't so impossible after all. What do we need? Well, we need 28 doublings we just calculated. How long do we have to wait for a doubling? One and a half years. So one and a half times 28 is 28, half 28 is 14, 28 plus 14 is um, 42. So that's the ultimate answer. That's how long we have to wait between getting H and getting V. When do we have H? 1979. So when should we get V? 79, 42, 21. Practically tomorrow. And that's where we're at. We're at the, 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 the edge of the glacier, almost ready for deep thought to spurt out its answer. We just got to get this last little bit. And we have the tools to calculate V, and I'm going to show you the ingredients. We're not there yet. You've got some work to do. But the tools we have, first on a regional scale, this is an example where we use a 150 meter model. And it shows, the, 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 it, it visualizes for you how this vertical transport works in the form of storms which take moisture and energy from the surface and up deep in the atmosphere where it's colder and it's radiated away. And it shows you how you can also represent the clouds, even these thin layers of clouds, which you see here, which look a bit like that original picture of the Alte Schwede, the stone and the dock and the, and, the, and, the, and the thin clouds that I showed at the beginning. So if we let that run forward in time, what you see is how they, you know, pumps energy through the atmosphere. And we're going to unfold this because the trick is, is to take calculations like this, which were done on the scale of Germany. Here we're, looking at them from the, here we're looking at them from the top. We'll look at calculations like this and we'll unfold that and we have to do this globally. So we can't do it now. Here I'm doing it graphically. I'm visualizing for you how we go from the scales we want to solve to the global scales. And I'm showing you how close we're getting. So this is where we go to the global scales. Not quite 
at the fine scale that we want, but not far, and close enough to see what we need to do to get there and that we're going to get there. So these calculations here, now we're, we're running globally on some of the biggest machines we have available in Europe. And it allows us to outline how far we are from that tip of the glacier to get the ultimate answer from the ultimate machine, which you guys are building. So let's see where that takes us. Here we are. We, we can see where the glacier is. We see the last steps we, we have to make. It's a scramble, but we know now we're going to get there. We're going to get to that glacier probably just before it disappears, and we'll be able to give you the answer. I want to show you quick some numbers to convince you of that. So the numbers that I have here are based on the um, benchmarking on some of the big machines in Europe. We work a lot on Pitstein lately, so this uh, beautiful machine that's ending its lifetime in the Swiss National Computing Center. Mistral, our workhorse here in Hamburg at the German Climate Computing Center. And recently at Jules Booster at the Uli Computing um, Center has allowed us to do some of the benchmarks. And what we try to calculate is throughput. You know, to do the calculation, what we need is to be able to simulate a certain number of days per day to be useful. So if we can't simulate tomorrow before it arrives, then why bother? Kind of the 75 million years. So to be useful, we want to be able to simulate roughly 100 days per day. And we want to do it at a scale where the, the global grid is about 1.5 kilometers. So with these simulations, we can show at 5 kilometers, we get 50 simulated days per day, S, um, per petaflop. And on some more complicated architectures, it's about 25. So we can use this, this sort of um, flop scaling. I know it's not perfect. And I know all the problems, but it works for this, um, to kind of extrapolate forward. And we say, well, how much more intensive is the computation if we go to the scale we want, 1.25 you know, kilometers, a factor of four? So if you do the math of going from the five kilometer model at this 50s per petaflop, what we need is two to the seven, so 128. And we need two to three of that. The time part has to be strong scaling. But we can do that. So we need another 100 a factor of 100 from these sort of workhorse machines we're using now, and that's already there. That's in place. I mean, if you look at um, the Joules booster, we could do this calculation that we want. We could get the throughput that we want, but maybe we could only do it once. Machines like Fugaku and the emergence of, of Exascale is showing that not only are these calculations feasible, but they're going to be practical. So you'd say, ah, we don't have to wait too long. You guys don't have to do too much work. We're almost there. But there's a, a bit more to the story. And if you remember those clouds I showed you in that picture with the stone, it turns out that they're a joker. And Manabi actually knew that they're a joker. The problem is maybe the clouds don't stay constant. They might increase or decrease as the planet warms. So it's not just a question of working out V. You got to work out what happens to these thin little clouds. And with a one and a half kilometer model, that might not get you there. But here, even here, we're so close to the glacier. And that's why it's a scramble. I think we can get there. We can get there. We need another factor of 10 in space. But by being clever, we don't need the throughput of S of 100. We can do short simulations that are time sliced from these coarser simulations. And we can work out if the clouds really are a joker. And that's what's outlined in the, in the rest of the numbers there. And it tells you how far away. But if we get an exaflop machine with the sort of performance characteristics of the machines we have now, or a multi exaflop machine, we'll be even able to work out the joker, the clouds. So there's a real chance that we can, we, 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 we can solve this problem. And that brings us to the end of deep thought. So deep thought gets us to the point where we can compute, 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 and we're almost there. Exascale will get us there to get the, the, the final answer. The problem is, it gets us to the glacier. And what's it tell us? We've gone all the way up the valley. We get to the glacier to tell you, according to my calculations, the glacier should be gone. And the glacier's gone. It's a bit like forgetting what the question was that we were asking in the beginning. But here's where Earth comes in. In building this machine to provide the ultimate answer to the ultimate question, 
we're going to be able to do so much more. And here I want to illustrate that because maybe it's not so relevant to tell you that the glacier is gone when it's gone. But did it go because of CO2 in the atmosphere or was that part of natural variability? Or here, if we look at this picture, this is September 10th of this year and California is burning. You can see the smoke. I mean, many of you know this better than I do. Was that climate change? Or was it just bad luck? Four days later, the Atlantic, it looks like the Van Gogh, the, 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 the starry night picture, because you see swirl after swirl after swirl. These are hurricanes, tropical storms, and pre-tropical storms, and tropical depressions. There's eight of them. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of these storms. I, I follow this stuff because I'm a bit of a geek in that way. And then you, 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 you might see one storm, kind of cool. You look at its eye. You might see two if you're really lucky. Once in a great while, you see three. And here we had eight. Climate change? Who knows? Wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't we want to know what we're doing to our Earth if it's causing things like this to happen? This is what we need Earth for. Earth in the sense of Douglas Adams. We need a new type of computing capability, not one that's going to give us an answer to tell us that the glacier's gone when the glacier's gone, but one in which we can interact with the system to learn wholly new things. And for that, we have to change something pretty profound. We have to change the way we work with machines, and that hasn't really changed at all through the progression of Morse laws. And here you can see that a little bit illustrated with this video, where you see, you know, in the early days of machines, we were putting tapes on the machine, we were typing in punch cards to, to to you know, enter our programs into the machine. We'd wait for the machine to calculate, and then the output would come, like um, you know, big printed output, and we'd kind of look through, you know, uh, 42. There comes, I, I think you can see it there, maybe. It's not much different today, if you think about it. Okay, we get to work in cafes, so we connect with Wi-Fi, but we're still there, that's the punch card. We're still moving tapes around. It's not, it's not some guy in a suit, it's a robot. Um, and okay, we don't have printouts looking for the number 42, but we can, you know, have guys in virtual environments putting pictures on screens, which visually show you 42, but it's the same serial workflow. But we can do it differently, and you see it here. You know, this is, the, the, the cool thing about this is the, the old way of interacting machines involves experts and layers and layers of expertise, serialness, you know, beginning, middle, end. Here we see the future. And it's not just because they're kids. These are the grandkids of a good colleague of mine. And they're interacting with a machine. And as brilliant as this colleague is, and as brilliant as these kids probably are, they don't know CUDA. They don't even know Python. They probably don't even know English. They couldn't write a sentence. But they're interacting with a machine. So we're creating, we see it happening. We're creating ways to interact with machines like we need to interact with machines to solve these big problems. And so some of us are visualizing th these Earth information systems where we take machines like Deep Thought and expose their information content to users who can, who can work through the consequences of their actions, of their policies, of their imaginations, of their hypotheses, to try to understand how changes in ag agriculture will affect food security in Africa, or how changes with warming will affect um, flooding in Northern Europe. This is what we need to do. And we meaning you guys who are going to build the machines and us guys who are going to be developing the models that you can put on those machines. And it turns out some people actually get this. And there's a big effort behind it. Here's the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Let's listen. And with the European Green Deal, we are aiming high. Europeans are calling on us to drive the change. Now it's up to us to answer their call. Thank you so much. It turns out that there's real money behind this Green Deal and a brilliant vision. And the brilliant vision is building planetary information systems that allow us to work through the consequences of our actions, of our policies, to see how they affect our world so that we can build a more sustainable future. And it involves a partnership between people like you and people like me, and it provides funding, and it envisions a, 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 a grand new attempt to understand how our world works and how we're influencing it. 
It's coupled, if it's done right, with a wonderful data assimilation system. That's this circle that goes around it there, which allows you to don't panic. It's not one shot. We're building systems which can learn from data, which can, be, which can learn from their use to make ever more adaptive and, and, and clever systems for representing how the world works and the consequences of people's interactions with it. So this is the future. This is, this is Earth. This is building interactive systems. And that's our next job. So we have to get over that, 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 that rock cliff to the edge of the glacier just to tell people it's gone. But in getting over that last hurdle, we'll build the machines that we then need to turn inside out in the second phase to make Earth. So I'm going to leave you with that thought here, is that like Douglas Adams' book, we're going to all this trouble to make a big machine to make an ultimate answer to an ultimate question that doesn't matter anymore. But the beauty is, in doing that, we've created an information system that allows us to do what we need to do next, which is to create information systems that we can go into and we can literally grab the Earth, anyone, and see what the consequences of their actions mean for how things will evolve. What if we change agricultural policies in, 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 in Africa? How does that affect food security? What if the ice caps melt? How does that affect um, rising sea levels? What if we invest in a distributed way? How vulnerable are we to storms? Um, these are sorts of questions that people can ponder if we give them the right tools. And that's our job now, is to give them these tools. So that's the next great adventure after we get up to the ice, um, is to create new types of information systems where people can expose the full information content to users that can, can use that in a tangible way. And so with that thought, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and wish you a um, wonderful day. I'm here for questions for the next hour or so, um, and it's been a real pleasure. Thanks also to everyone who made this possible. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. Um, I want to introduce, our, I'm Kristen Quickie, our general chair, and I want to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Bjorn Stevens from the Max Planck Institute of Meteorology, who gave us that fantastic keynote. And I've seen a lot of really great questions rolling in, so we'll talk about a few of those. Um, one of the first ones we had is from, let's see, Timothy W. How far back in calendar time could you start a long-term exascale simulation and still have good enough historical measured data to spin up a good run or ensemble of runs for useful span of parameters? So we, uh, we, we, we typically start in the early um, 1900s or the, the late part of the 19th century, so the late 1800s. There we have already pretty good measurements of um, some of the ocean basins and a decent estimate of the global temperature record and a sense of some of the other parameters um, like the amount of CO2. So uh, sort of 100 years ago would be the sort of spin up and then you run it forward in time to see how likely the last century um, is from say an ensemble of simulations. So I'm not sure if that answered the question, but that's my interpretation of what it was in the answer. Okay. Uh, we have another one from Rob L. Are climate models still aiming for the five simulated years per wall clock day or have these complexities lowered that rate? Yeah, you know, people are greedy, so they want as much as they can um, get. But I think we can answer some pretty important questions with um, much less. So like I, I tried to outline in the talk for the, the big questions, how clouds respond, we would learn a tremendous amount from models which only had a throughput of um, a fraction of a day um, per day. 
for the production systems that we work with when we're doing a sort of a general purpose science, we aim for a year a day. Um, and our sort of workhorse models often have 30 years a day. So I call that S, the simulated days per day. And so the workhorse model has 30. I said, I'd be really happy, uh, 30 years per day. I'd be really happy with hundred days per day. So a third. And, um, and for some really important questions, we would rather have much, much higher resolution and um, simulate for a week. Okay. Uh, let's see, we have another question. Can, uh, in the, there is significant uncertainty in today's climate models. How do we handle this in the context of interacting with decision take makers, policy makers, and the general public in these new compute systems of the future? And that came in from Kirsten Kay. Yeah, so uh, those those calculations I was just talking about where I said I'd be happy if I could simulate, you know, a, a, a fraction of a day per day. Um, that's really to address some of the big uncertainty in climate models. And that has to do with how small scale circulation systems couple with clouds. So one way to go about some of those uncertainties is to throw the physics at it, is to actually resolve the processes that we know how to simulate and simulate them well. And that's a, that's a tactic many of us think we need to take, um, is to put all the physics we can in the model. Now, there's many things that we don't understand, which we can't solve with resolution. You can't simulate a tree. We don't really know the equations for a tree for the way ice particles you know, conglomerate and, and form bigger ice particles. A lot of that physics is fairly poorly understood. And so just adding more um, degrees of freedom to the model or adding more power won't necessarily help us there. And so one of the big questions is how much of that uncertainty that we have now actually comes from things that we don't know how to solve versus how much of it comes from the things that we know how to solve, but we just don't have enough computational power to solve. So I, I, I tend to say for climate modeling, there's two, uh, there, there's one abyss, which I call the con conceptual abyss, which is those things that we don't really know how, to, how, to, how they work like a tree. And then there's the computational abyss. Those are things that we know how they behave, but we just don't have enough computational power. So let's do everything we can to get over this computational abyss and see how much is left from the conceptual abyss. And there, what we found when we when we followed this path, what we found so far is that since Manavi's calculations in the late '60s, there were a million reasons those could have been really far off. And one way to look at the last 50 years is that we've been exploring how he could have been wrong, and we've been hard pressed to say um, how he's wrong. Of course, the answer might not be as precise as we would like it because you know he gave us sort of one and a half to four and a half degrees of warming. We think maybe it's maybe two to four. But, um, but every way in which we thought he could be wrong um, has not really panned out. And there's a few more ways one could try and that's what we're trying to do. But um, this is the way I kind of approach the question. Okay, thank you for that answer. We, one of our top voted questions is from Eli D. What needs to change in terms of data storage to complement the advances in computing in order to keep you productive? That's one I'm particularly interested in as well. Yeah, data, that's again, this thing that um, it depends what your expectation is. So earlier this year, I was in the field for a month um, around Barbados and we we're flying planes and we had ships. There were, there were four ocean class research vessels um, sailing around for a month. We had five airplanes and a whole flotilla of, you know, sail drones and sea gliders and, and drifters, um, all sorts of things. And if you think about it, the amount of data you collect with a ship is pretty tiny. It's just one line going through the ocean, but we spend a fortune getting it. You know, a big research ship is about 40,000 euro a day to run, I think. Um, and we make the best of it. So I, data for me is something, of course, you always want more, but you'd rather have a good simulation of the system and then treat it a bit like you treat the field. Um, you can't have everything. We can't measure everything at once. It's just fantastically expensive. So the real question is what can we get? But I would first say, let's, let's make this simulation as physical as we can and get as much data as possible. But maybe we have to approach data more like a field experiment. Although here, this is where I see the challenge going sort of post exascale is to find ways to make the model just more touchable, you know, really to break that whole stream of input, run, output, you know, with expert, 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 but really allow people, a good colleague of mine, Thomas Schultes at CSCS had this um, thought, which I follow a lot, which is the idea that we, we create the models that can run at exascale. And then we, we if, if they're a bit reproducible, we can chuck them up, chunk them up into time slices. 
push them to the cloud, and then people will just rerun the model, getting the output that they want. So they're just much more interactive systems. So I think we have to think about data not as much in the magnitude because we'll always lose, but in the way in which we access the data, our ability to rerun the model and our ability to actually not program our analysis on the output when it sits on the disk, but actually to program the analysis on the code. You know, So we say to the model what we want. And right now, if you think of the whole workflow for models, it's kind of crazy because we, we think really hard about what to output. We think really hard how to make the code efficient to output that. And then we get this whole data log jam at the, at the back end. And we, yeah, so, so we really need new approaches there. So let's talk about a transition from deep thought to earth. So we've, we're building deep thought. If we how do we build earth? How can we keep going with Moore's law? Or are we going to be able to, to get to earth? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the hard things we have in, in climate science, and I just alluded to that a bit in the presentation, is this limitation from strong scaling. So every time we make the simulation finer in scale, we um, communicate information from one part of the domain to its neighbor more quickly. So we have to take smaller time steps. Even if you do things with implicit solvers, you're iterating more. And so there's really no way around the fact that that um, time is a limitation and the finer you go, the shorter the time step and the shorter the time step, the more time steps you have to take to actually simulate a day. And the only way to speed that up is through the strong scaling. And so that's a real limitation. And if we, if we look at the models that we're creating now and we wanted to make them run at say 100 meters or 10 meters or one meter, you would, even if Moore's law, you know, what kills you is the strong scaling part of that computation because none of the computational advances that we're making really helps a lot on the strong scaling. So that's why I think we get to one, uh, a workhorse machine that can go at one kilometer and then we change the game. I mean, we turn it inside out and we say, let's, let's try to think about how we can make these useful as information systems, not as just something that gives you a number like 42, but as something that, you know, the, the, the girl in the, in the cartoons could kind of grab and touch and open and manipulate. Um, and that's where I think there's a lot of room for really cool computer science because how you do that, how you extract the information content of the model, that might not be a simple, you know, moving data from one part of the model to the user. It might be um, involve compression with machine learning. So you 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 want to you want to understand where is the information content? How can I get it efficiently out? And we can think of that about that in in, in in completely different ways. And to me, that's an exciting challenge in in Germany, what we call informatics or or um, computer science. So, so what, to get there, we need, we, we need efforts in this direction. Um, All right. Thank you for that answer. Uh, we've got another question that came in from Jessica B. What are your current standards to validate your simulations? Yeah, they're, 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 they're mixed. Um, so the current class of models that we use, we normally compare them to things like how well they represent the 20th century. Um, and then you can do that at very different scales. So you can ask yourself globally, does it represent the global temperature evolution, right? And all of these, all of these validation endeavors are a bit fraught with difficulty because it's not like we don't know what the last hundred years of temperature was. So when people build models, they tend to reject the models that it's not like we hold back training data. You know, we throw everything we know at the model. And so in the end, the development of the current class of models isn't really independent of what we know about the climate system. And that's a bit the frustrating thing because you never really know when you're curve fitting and when you're putting in physics, especially when you're, when you're dealing with these sort of, um, how should I describe them? What we call them parameterizations, but they're simplified representations of the physics. So we're not writing down Navier-Stokes equations where we're saying, well, this object, it's like the tree, you know, we say a tree kind of behaves like that. And there you have tremendous freedom as to how you decide a tree behaves. And you normally take the one that gives you the best result. That doesn't mean that's the right one because it might be compensating for another error. So climate modeling is really fraught with this difficulty. And that's why in the end, the most important thing is how you reason because it's, we don't wanna be stuck like you know the people 75 million years later with 42 as the answer. And then we're just sort of servants of the model. So the important thing is being able to use these models in a way in which we can develop arguments and reasoning that allows us to look at the problem a different way and then check that independently. 
So this idea of model validation, I think, is sometimes the wrong path because we, you know, it, it ends up just turning into fitting. Um, and the right path is to, you know, we still can't get away from the fact that we have to understand how these things work. And the models are tools to help us understand how they work. And when we understand how they work, we can anticipate surprises in ways which give us confidence in our understanding. And so I think that's the, in the end, um, we, 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 we need our, our brains. Um, <laughs> Agree. Um, so we have a good question came in from Daniel T. What sort of programming languages and systems are you using for those simulations? Is that ancient Fortran code, or newly implemented packages? Yeah, so the, the field there is wide open and, and fast moving. So a lot, of, a lot of climate model codes are written in, in Fortran. The bulk of our code is in Fortran. There's um, a big desire right now that to, to you know, we're sitting right with one leg on GPUs and one leg on CPUs. So we just had a long discussion at my institute this morning. You know, we have one part of the model that runs very nice on GPUs with a new treatment of radiative transfer that was developed by the uh, group at um, um, NOAA and, and, and Department of Energy. And we have another older version of that code, which runs wonderfully on CPUs. And we're trying to maintain both of those codes. So like many people, we're stuck with this problem that we want code that's performance portable and we'd like to separate the sort of um, architecture specific implementation of the algorithm from the specification of what you're trying to solve. And so we use domain specific languages for that. And there, the, like I said, things are wide open from groups using Julia to groups using Python with a back end, which then ports that to um, um, maybe C for optimization or something else. And that's very dynamic because what we're seeing is languages are changing all the time. They're evolving differently. You know, last year's um, Python person is this year's Julia's per person and next year's something else. And when you deal with code bases, which um, are about anywhere from 100,000 to a million lines of code, it becomes a challenge um, to, to deal with that. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I'll be really interested to see um, what, the, what the latest one is that comes out next year for... Uh, yeah. For climate science, that'll be fun. So we've got another question that says, you haven't really addressed the question of uncertainty and scenarios. Don't we need another factor of a thousand or so to capture and quantify the uncertainties in our data and models? Well, there's two, I think there's two questions there. The person said uh, uh, uncertainty in scenarios. And so normally when I think about the scenarios, I think of the future scenarios. So there is a fair amount of uncertainty when we, a huge amount of uncertainty when we predict the future is, um, what will the future look like? How much CO2 will be put in there? Will we have a giant volcano that, that, that happens? You know, will there be a war? Um, so all sorts of things can happen in the future. And so that's an enormous sort of uncertainty which you can just um, speculate about. The other part of the question made me think that the person was asking a little bit about the past. And I don't know, Christine, if you understood that better, but I'm not sure I understood exactly what the person was asking there. Maybe say it again. It was Daniel T or who was that? Uh, let's see, it was, uh, oh gosh, I've lost it. Um, mm -hmm. I put a pin in that and we will um, go okay. back to that question. And shortly. if that person can kind of specify a bit more, it might help me it understand was, what they meant there. Right, uh, let's see. That's gonna take me a second to find. So okay. yeah. um, what we can, there was somebody that has a question. So I'll remind everybody that's watching, if you want to put a question in um, our question chat, we will we'll see that. And if you see one that you're interested in answering, but you haven't asked it, if you vote for it, that um, increases the number of points that we see. So we'll it'll have a stand a better chance of getting answered. So um, while we're looking for that one, uh, so Jan C is asking, this might be a little controversial maybe. So by applying the current global model climate models and historical reference data, can we determine that the currently experienced global warming is not a natural variation? Is my view correct here? Yeah, this was this this was the Hasselman contribution that I called out kind of in the middle of the talk, the, the, my pre predecessor, and and what you find is that um, different sources of warming have a different think of it as a fingerprint on the system. And so what Manabi, for instance, showed is that when you increase the greenhouse gas, 
it leads to the stratosphere to cool because the stratosphere is a balance between the warming from ozone and the cooling from a greenhouse gas. And if you have more greenhouse gases, it comes into equilibrium by cooling and the troposphere, the lower part of the atmosphere warms. This isn't the same as if, if, if you would um, warm the system by heat coming out of the interior of the earth or the deep ocean or from solar radiation um, heating the earth. So different sources of warming imprint themselves on the system in a different way. And so you can, try to look for that signal, just the way you would look for gravitational waves and the signal from you know, a LIGO detector or something like that. You look for the fingerprint of, of, of that type of warming. And what you find is that the pattern of warming that we see um, based on everything we know can only be explained by CO2. Um, and that's been work now that's sort of been confirmed and reconfirmed over the past say 30 years. Um, but that's how one, it's a, it's a signal to noise detection problem and you use the models to say, what is the pattern and nature of the warming that you would expect from a greenhouse gas? Um, so that's why people are pretty confident that it's um, the warming we're seeing is mostly due to um, CO2. Okay, good to know, great, great answer. Uh, we got another question from Alastair J. A kind of a follow-up to the other programming models question. Would you and other climate scientists what would you want in a new DSL or programming language? And or what changes would you like to see in existing programming models? Yeah, so for the DSL, for me, the, the thing that kills us when we program is that the, the, the architecture is not abstracted from the equation, right? So if you have an equation that you wanna solve, it might involve a gradient. And so you need, you know, so you have in Fortran language, you know, you have IJKs or you have KIJs. And so you're, when you're solving the problem, you're dealing with the way the problem lives in memory. And most of our energy um, is spent on moving the bits around, not in actually doing stuff with them. And so you'd like the programming language to be able to abstract that um, so that you can just write kind of in a way that we do implicitly in a lot of you know, um, interpretive languages where you don't really think about how the, how, the, how, the, how the problem is laid out in memory and someone else handles that on the back end. So this would be the separation of concerns from the computer scientist to the physical scientist because what do I care about how the computer is laid out? Right. So you'd like a more natural way of abstracting that. Right now we, 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 we deal with that with all sorts of nasty directives um, for managing OpenMP and MPI and, 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 um, and OpenACC and all sorts of other different calls. So you'd like, maybe that wouldn't be one language, but you would like an approach which allows you to separate at that point and use different tools on either end of that interface, you know, between where the equation is. Um, the other thing I think what climate models need to do is that the equations we solve actually aren't that many for the big problems. So the, the Navier-Stokes equations, they look not too different from the primitive equations I showed at the beginning of the talk from Bjarkness. There's an extra prognostic equation there and some extra treatments for water substance. But in the end, there are a handful of equations and, and most of the code we have is spent solving the things that we don't know how they work. And that also makes the portability problem. So if you look at the you know, million lines of code that people like to talk about in a climate model, probably 500,000 to 800,000 lines of that code, you know, 50 to 80% are doing the little things, the bells and whistles that people put on the other models. So, so what we're trying to do partly as we look towards exascale is to reduce the code base to just the essential things that the physics and treat the things that we don't know as simple as possible and see how far we get in, in the ability of that system to represent the climate. And there the programming paradigms become a lot easier because we just express a lot less um, functionality in the code. So, um, you know, the, the, the equations we solve are fairly simple. They, they're, they're regular, you know, second year calculus in an American university and off you go. All right. Uh, we've got another good question that came in. Um, and I, I'm really, I'm particularly interested in this one, uh, just trying, elevator speeches are a thing that um, I have to do often to try to get people to understand why supercomputing is so important to everything that they do every day. So if you could, from Donna C if, uh, is asking, if you could summarize it in one minute or less to explain to policymakers what humans are doing to climate and therefore what we could change to affect climate change. Yeah, so uh, climate's warming. 
humans are responsible. We've we've had a rough idea that this might be the case for about 100 years and a pretty good idea for the past 50 years and maybe for the past 20 or 30 years since Hasselman where we're, we're darn sure. But beyond that, it gets a lot harder. You know, there's some things that go with that that we can say um, about hydrological extremes and, and, and poleward amplification of warming. And there's always a good reason, not because, the, you know, anything we believe, we don't believe just because the model does it, but we've been able to reason our way to it, and we see um, we see it in observations. It's 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 seen in many different ways. So it's pretty clear that humans are changing the climate of the planet. And my question is, do you really want to do that? <laughs> I mean, you, you know, <laughs> maybe you'll be lucky. It might just turn out fine, but it doesn't seem like the best use of our creativity as a as a species to take that gamble. Um, and when I talk to people, I would say, what, shouldn't we unleash human creativity? In, um, in other ways, in trying to find a way to, you know, um, advance human happiness without, uh, without taking the risk that we're, we're changing our climate in, in ways that we won't be able to get out of again. It's a, it's a slow moving system and we don't really know where it's headed. And do we wanna do that? Yeah, yeah so for I'll, me the answer I'll... is obvious, but. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll have to say, having spent a couple of hours in the eye wall of Hurricane Zeta a couple of weeks ago, I definitely would prefer that we not. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy that uh, that you're working on that problem for us. All right. We have another question. How much data do you need to initialize the model and how long can you simulate before the error starts becoming exponential? Yeah. So there's two things there. Um, normally, when we think of an initial value problem, we start from the initial data and then because of the the the, the um, nonlinear dynamics and the chaos in the systems, the trajectory that the system follows diverges from the trajectory it would follow if there was just, you know, a one bit flip or something like that. So, so the trajectories diverge and that's the weather problem, the initial value problem. And that's, you know, two weeks or something like that. And it doesn't really get better. At some point you can have more and more information about uh, more and more in the systems, but it doesn't really let you follow the trajectory for a whole lot longer because the way the errors grow at small scales. We think of climate as a boundary value problem. So it's really governed by the, the boundary values. And, and so what are the boundary values? It's the solar input, it's the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, it's the layout of the continents. Um, and that's pretty static. There is a question that people could ask is how much uh, transigence is there in the climate system? So if you think of the climate as sort of the envelope of all the weather trajectories, sort of like the basin, the shape of the basin that the marble is rolling around in, you know, how fixed is that? Or does that evolve on different timescales? And th that's a bit of an unknown territory. Um, so how the slow variations in the climate system convolve with natural variability. So is there sort of a sweet spot of predictability there where the boundary conditions are evolving slow enough that you can really describe how the system behaves and take them as static? Or is the natural variability in the system so large that it sort of bleeds into the slow evolution of the boundary conditions. And I, I don't think there's a good answer to that. Okay. Uh, so our top voted question at the moment is from Ali S. Do you use your climate models to test different climate engineering solutions, i.e. sulfates, um, using sulfates to change the earth's um, albedo? If so, what are some of the more optimal climate engineering solutions? Yeah, well, the best climate engineering, yes. So the, the, the short answer is yes, we do. Um, and the, the second short answer is the best one is to reduce um, or eliminate further CO2 emissions because that's actually, a, you know, <laughs> it's not a Band-Aid, that's the, that's the problem. And so that's the best one. And if you, you know, of course, most people who pose that question, they're, they're thinking about the case where we can't reduce CO2 emissions. What could we do then if we had to preserve something? And there, I think the, the, the solar radiation management in the stratosphere always comes out as the most effective in, in many measures. The problem I have with all of that sort of thinking is that it 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 presumes that we could do this, you know. So, if you think about putting sulfate in the stratosphere, sure, technically we can do it. We send up rockets and put sulfate in the stratosphere. But imagine if the United States decided to do that, and Russia had the biggest drought it ever had the next year. You know, you'd be in trouble. It'd be a problem. Um, and those sorts of things will happen. And so anytime you think about that, you need a global regulatory framework. And I have a hard time thinking that we could develop a regulatory framework to allow us to put sulfur in the stratosphere and not be able to develop the regulatory framework, which allows us to reduce the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. 
So I see those problems as really from a social political sense coupled, although what do I know about social political things? So I don't, I don't, don't listen to me too much there. That's, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Frank B. If we looked back at the dramatic changes of our climate in let's say the past 10, 000, or 100,000 years to 10 million years, and we started to test our best simulation with the best data from that time, would our models simulate onset and the onset, excuse me, and end of an ice age correctly? Or easier, if we started to say in let 1500, would the model simulate the little ice age about the time of the Maunder minimum correctly? A simulation that delivers those events correctly would be extremely trustworthy and silence many who are still not yet convinced. Yeah, so there's programs to do that. We, we had a project here where we worked on the little ice age and I, I must say, I don't know what the, what the, the latest thinking is on how well we understand the Little Ice Age. So I probably will get myself in trouble if I come on on that. Um, there's another big <laughs> initiative in Germany called Palmod, which I'm not involved with, but I, I know of, and that's um, for modeling the paleo. So a guy named Moja Latif and another guy, Martin Clausen, um, at my institute are very involved in that. And that's exactly that idea that was from the German ministry. They said, well, you know, can you simulate the onset of the Ice Age? And here again, the problem I have with this is it's great and it would be trustworthy, but we know the answer. And so it, it, it doesn't get you past this problem that there's a lot of unknown physics that go into that, how great ice sheets you know, initiate and how they grow um, and how they move. And so even if you did that, um, so people do this with simpler models, you know, people take very simple models that were sort of pre manabi models and they simulate ice ages all the time. But you know, you know what the, the answer should be and you keep fiddling with the model until it gives you the right answer. And, and so do you really trust it? And that's why I think there's no way around the fact that we have to we have to approach these problems with reason, and just you know setting a sort of a hurdle from the past climate and saying if you simulate that I believe you, is might get, get us in more might be more trouble than help in the end. Okay. Got another one from Anouk B. How certain is it that the last bit of computer capacity is sufficient to answer these questions and solve our problems? Or will these answers have enough uncertainty for us individuals or politics to react differently on climate change than we have until now? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, so it's a <laughs> bit of a, it's, that's, that's the wager that we're making right now is that if we get up to the tip, you know, get over that rock scramble and get to the edge of the glacier that we'll be able to show that there is um, information that we've uncovered that allows us to make much better predictions. So even on, on, on all sorts of scales, not just how the world will behave with more CO2. So if you think about it right now, we kind of think we don't want the world to warm up too much. And so you say, how much CO2 can we put in the atmosphere? And you can end up with a factor of three difference. I mean, it's a huge number because of the uncertainty. And so that question is kind of saying, you know, would we reduce that? Would we have a much better idea of how much CO2 could be emitted before we get in trouble if we could build these models? And that's, that's the wager. Um, I think that's what we have to try to do, but I can't really say in all great faith we'll know exactly. A lot of us think there's good reason to believe that you will get a lot more information out of the system. But on other timescales, um, one of the fields of inquiry is called the Cato prediction. So how much, how much can we say, because we understand how the slow ocean evolves and other things, um, how much can we say about what, what the weather patterns will look like 10 years from now? And there's some curious paradoxes where the natural world seems more predictable than the existing models. So there's this sense that there's hidden predictability in the system. And so if, there's, if, if that exists, it would be tremendously valuable. And so the way as a scientist, I would approach that is trying to say, let's take everything we know and, and surmount this computational abyss, you know, compute as much as we can to find out how good we can do. Um, so that's a bit the adventure. Is, is, is we don't know exactly where we'll end up. There's good reason to think we'll learn a lot more if we do this last little bit, but it's science, um, so nothing's guaranteed. Okay, thank you for that. So I think we have time for one more question and um, we will try to go ahead and answer all the questions in chat if you wanna come back and see the answer. Um, but this last question from Ruroshi S, having solved the ultimate question almost, what's next for the field? Yeah, that's Earth. Um, that's, that's, that's really this young woman grabbing that system, um, as I was saying, and being, you know, being able to try out her own ideas. Um, so being able to create systems that people can
can manipulate on their own. Because the thing about the earth is that um, we know how it works. You know, when, if you're a water manager, you know what a flood looks like. I mean, you don't need to know Fortran to mess with a flood. You, 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 you know what heavy rains look like. You know the different ways in which you can lay out your city or if you're an agricultural policymaker. I mean, all of the things we're dealing with, we know how they work. What we don't know how to do is express these ideas in the language that an earth system model can digest. And so I think once we have these systems and you push them as, as Thomas Schultes would have, you push them to the cloud and let people run them and you can analyze them on the cloud, we should develop frameworks where people can use their own native intuition to, to play with these virtual earths in the same way those kids could use their intuition to play with a tractor. You know, They knew what a tractor was, so they had this idea that you could push the tractor and the tractor would move. And so as we showed in the cartoon at the end, if you're that young woman, you can push. She looked a lot like Greta, didn't she? Um, um, but anyway, so you, if you, <laughs> you wanna solve problems, you can work through your thoughts in a, in a sort of intuitive or tangible way without having to convert those into a sophisticated language that you feed up through experts and come back down through ex experts who say 42 at the end. All right, great. It's Great question and answer session. Really appreciate it. Really, really enjoyed the keynote. Um, I do want to thank everyone who has joined us from all over the world. Um, and I want to encourage you again that uh, we'll, we'll answer some of these questions in chat. I want to wish you a great SC20. Again, thank you for your support all the, all, over all these years. And thank you again, Professor Stevens, for the fantastic uh, uh, keynote and discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you, and thanks to the whole, thanks to the whole team from um, Supercomputing 2020. It's been really fantastic. Great.